Mrs. Green. If you have your Bibles, open Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5 tonight. If you would, thanks again for being here. Thanks for many of you helping. Uh, many of you are helping with our mega trunk or treat in a few minutes. Ephesians chapter 5, I want to, with the Lord's help this afternoon and next Sunday night, uh, look at and talk about how to vote as a Christian. The title of the message, For God and Country, Election 2020. Seems like you can't uh, get away from these elections right now. Everywhere you look, you see something, hear something, have to put up with something. Uh, in 1938, 1938, the name Boston Curtis appeared on the ballot for the Republic Committee men from Wilton, Washington. Boston Curtis um, actually won that election. Interesting thing being that Austin Cur Boston Curtis was not a person. He was the town's mayor's mule. The town mayor wanted to see who would vote for his mule if you put him on the ballot? And sure enough, many people did and said, oh, and, and maybe that's happened to you before. You've looked at the ballot or you've looked at the issues saying, oh boy, I can't begin to understand what's going on. How do I navigate this? I've gotten some phone calls, some texts. They say, Pastor, how do I vote? Now, a couple of things uh, for separation of church and then with a 501c3 in the church, all right? What am I allowed to say from here? Well, first of all, I cannot tell you who to vote for, all right? I will help guide you. And I cannot say who I'm voting for while I'm preaching, okay? But if I'm not preaching, and I'm preaching right now, so I won't say right now, then I can say whatever I want to say as a citizen of the United States, all right? So pastors are absolutely allowed to have an opinion about this stuff uh, without losing and, and being in danger of a tax-exempt status or anything like that. Uh, some will, will put you on a fear-mongering and say, well, church can't do anything like that. In fact, next Sunday morning is our public servants day, and we'll invite all the candidates, whoever can come, to come up here. We'll all let them say a, a word of greeting, and that's perfectly acceptable, perfectly legal, uh, because we're not endorsing one or the other in that regard. But there's some issues that as Christians we have to talk about that we have to know about in, in election and especially this ele election. We live in a, in a strange time, do we not? All right, it seems that, that everywhere you look, there is some type of political ad or um, a debate that is full of slander and self-angrandizing speech. Look how good I am, look how bad someone else is. I don't know if you're ever on YouTube, but on YouTube, every, it seems like every YouTube video for church or whatnot begins with a political uh, uh, advertisement. It seems like you can't spend more than a minute on social media and not see advertisement after advertisement. This is why I'm better than the other person. Has it not seemed like throughout the COVID crisis and pandemic that it has been incredibly politicized? All right, that everyone has claimed what they have done is successful, and it says, oh, look at me, what I've done, I've been incredibly successful, therefore vote for me, but incredibly politicized. It seems at times more politicized than it has been successful. Rather than figuring out how to make it work, just make this a platform for me to, to be better than somebody else on there. Beyond that, it becomes tiresome and wearisome. You turn on the television or turn on the radio, and yet again, it comes, it seems to be bombarding us. And it seems as if everyone we know has a very strong view of politics. Most people are not moderate in their political views. They are extremists in the sense that what they believe, they believe strongly. If they're pro this one candidate, they will be as strongly as this one may be against that candidate. And it is, it is a, a source of stress and conflict. You can look on social media at times and you just see argument after argument after argument. Sometimes foolish arguments or maybe often foolish arguments. Well, how do we navigate this as a Christian? What are we supposed to do? Does the Bible talk about that as all? Does the Bible tell us how we ought to live? Does the Bible care what we post on social media? Does the Bible dictate to us how we ought to vote in an election? How do we navigate these times as a Christian? You see, I don't have to, really, for a democratic process to work, I don't have to agree with you. I don't even have to really like you. In fact, some of you are like, well, I don't like you, Pastor. Fair enough, fair enough. I don't have to be the same as you. 
Someone said this in a democratic process, that every vote can count, even votes that are stupid or vicious. It's true. Every vote can count. They said the difference is in other countries, those votes actually run the country. In our country, they just count as a vote. So I'm thankful for the country we live in, all right? Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful we live in America. I'm thankful for that. But we live in dire times, not because of a great political divide, though that is, that is, that is just one symptom of the greater problem. All right, some would say, and even some Christians would say, wow, we are just in a whole heap of trouble that, if, that if, um, if we don't get the president we want in the November election, then we're in a whole heap of trouble and this country's going to be over. We are in dire straits and dire times, but I would suggest and submit not for the same reason as some may think. I would suggest and submit that we're in dire times because we've strayed far from the Lord. And the house of God, people of God, have strayed far from the Lord. And one symptom of that is a broken country. The Bible teaches us that. And there are times our country is broken and it needs our influence from the gospel. I found, or someone found for me some of these statistics. Why we live in dire times. Do you know that 50% of regular churchgoers say they've never had a religious experience that changed their life? I'm sorry, 57%, not 50, 57%. So that means 57% of all regular churchgoers would not even say they'd have a regular experience that changed their life, a religious experience that changed their life. Over 20% of evangelicals, and we are evangelicals, all right? We believe in the Bible, e evangelists, all right? Evangelicals. Over 20% are not even sure that heaven is a real place. Now, how can we not believe heaven is a real place if we don't even start with some basic Bible truths? All right, God is real, Jesus died on the cross, heaven is a real, literal place, as is hell. We're in a heap of trouble. 69% of churchgoers believe everyone will go to heaven. 52% of all Christians, those who claim to be Christians, believe that non-Christian faiths can lead to eternal life. There was a well-known Christian leader who in print in a book said that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. All right, we do not worship the same God. All right, we have a different book. Ours is not the Quran, ours is called the Bible. Jehovah is different than Allah. All right, we worship different gods. There's a different way to heaven. There is a different punishment. We worship different gods. Well-known, well-known um, Christian evangelical leader. Even he's, he's a Baptist and says that Muslims and Christians in print worship the same God. We do not worship the same God. And 69% of all churchgoers believe that everyone will go to heaven. They said that they, they interviewed uh, even young Christians ages 18 to 24, and more than half, from 18 to 24, 18 to 24, more than half believe that the Bible is the Word of God. More than half of them believe that. That's a travesty. If, if we were to go through our school and ask our young people, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? And if only half believed that, we would not say, wow, that's successful. If 51%, if more than half, we'd not say, wow, we are doing a great job at Bridgeport Baptist Academy, would we? Or would we say, oh my goodness, we have dropped the ball. All right? We are in dire straits, not for the same reasons because the country is broken, but because as Christians and because of God's truth, we've dropped the ball. Get this one. Atheists and agnostics, on average, score 15% higher on knowledge of religion than evangelical Christians. I didn't make these statistics up. So if someone claimed to be an atheist or agnostic, on average they'll score 15% higher than we would on knowledge of religion. Now I hope, I, I don't know how that could be true, but it, I mean, they, they did this study. What a travesty. In America, they say 25% of Americans are done with church. And 48% of them, almost half, say they're done with God. 
known as post-Christians, they claim that God plays no role whatsoever in their life. In half, in a recent poll, half of all Americans have never read the Bible. Not have you read it every day or once in the past week. According to a poll, half of all Americans have never read the Bible. As we approach this time in this election and these tumultuous times, we have to understand that being a Christian means being different. We are called to be different. We are called to be salt and light. We are called to look at these things through the light of God's Word. Sometimes in, in, this, in these elections, people get sidetracked by issues that are not core issues. What's important? What does God care about? What are some core issues? Well, really, next Sunday night, I'd like to deal with a couple of those core issues that I believe are found clearly in God's Word. Let me talk about a couple things at risk of irritating most of you or some of you. Let me tell you a few things that are not core issues. Education is not a core issue. It's not. It's not. How much money they spend on education is not a core issue. Government assistance is not a core issue. Gun rights is not a core issue. I was getting to that one right there. It's not popular in evangelical circles among Christians. Now, don't get me wrong, I am all for gun rights. I believe in supporting the Second Amendment. I personally have a concealed pistol license. All right? If you're wondering if I'm carrying, no, I am not. I couldn't tell you any, but I'm not. All right? I'm preaching. All right? I am for that. But that is not a core issue. But I know Christians who will place that above core issues, like abortion, like the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of life. Those are core issues. Those are what we must look at. God calls us to something. I want us to look in Ephesians chapter 5 as we kind of look in some broad sense today. Some broad sense what we are called to. In verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light, wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Lord, help us in the next few moments. May our hearts be touched. Lord, may we look at how you want us to walk and live in this present day and time. Lord, may we walk circumspectly as wise, Lord, not as fools. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you from this passage just a few thoughts, a few brief thoughts this afternoon, and then build upon that next, next Sunday night, the good Lord willing. How we should walk in this time. The, the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Days are short. Days are vain, and we live in an evil time. I don't think anyone would argue here online that, that these days are not great days. There's some turmoil out there. There's a lot of things at stake out there. And more than ever, Christians are called to a few things. First of all, they're called, I believe in these verses, they're first of all called to an awareness, verse number 13. But all things that are approved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. You see, God is a bringer of light. God is light, all right? He will make evident the truth that we crave and so desperately need. What that means is that God brings to us discernment. As a Christian, I should have spiritual discernment, spiritual light. Have you ever talked to a Christian that, or claims to be a Christian, that as you talk to them, there seems to be no spiritual light? Everything they say seems to have a, a worldly or secular slant to it. 
Every argument they bring is, is not even one that would have a foundation in God's word. It's, it's not, there's like, it seems like there is no light there at all. And it's kind of a conundrum. Kind of like, I don't know why you're talking this way because you sound just like anyone else who wants saved. Have you ever talked to someone though his, who is a spiritual person? And you've been touched by their spirituality while they talk. Have you ever had the experience where you talk to someone and it seems as if it's from the oracles of God, seems as if wisdom comes from above in their speech, in their pattern of speech, in the language that they use, in the reasoning. God brings to us spiritual discernment, things that we can now begin to understand true form and true nature of actions, words, and decisions. You see, if we're not careful, we will navigate this world through our own senses. How I, how I see, how I relate, and how I decide. We'll make decisions. Oh, this is a good candidate. This is not a big deal. Rather than from the light from God's Word. This, God, God, this Word brings discernment to us. They did the experiment. They tried to figure out what is easier for you to understand or to tell the difference of. A quarter of an ounce or a quarter of a pound. Upon this experiment, they had a ball, two bowling balls, and one bowling ball weighed 10 pounds, and the other bowling ball weighed 10 pounds and a quarter ounces, 0.4 ounces. Then they had two envelopes. One weighed an ounce and another half, and one weighed an ounce and a quarter. They say, they tell me, that it is easier to tell the difference between the two envelopes. That if one weighs an ounce, another half ounce, and one ounce and a quarter, you can tell that easier than a bowling ball, almost a quarter of a pound. They said the, the, the smaller the difference, the harder it is to discern. Life can be tricky. Life's weightier matters, weightier issues can sometimes be more difficult to navigate, to figure out. And that's why spiritual discernment is key. And 1 Corinthians tells us this, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I've seen things like this. Well, I'm not going to vote for a certain candidate because I don't like his attitude. Now, that can definitely be a factor. Our attitudes are important, are they not? Attitudes are important. I'm not saying it's not an issue. But attitude is not a core issue. Well, I'm not going to vote for this candidate because he can't seem to put, to put two coherent thoughts together. Well, that could be a different reason, all right? But, but, but all of a sudden we go to personalities in our decisions. Rather than find, finding spiritual discernment, what is at stake? Understand that when you vote, when I vote, I am not voting for a pastor, first of all. All right? I'm not voting for a date. I voted for people I'd never take on a date. All right? I don't necessarily have to like them, all right? But there are some core issues. And sometimes it seems like it's the lesser of two evils, does it not? All right? But the Bible says, and, and God says in Ephesians, that there is a spiritual discernment that needs to happen. We're going to see what that looks like as we look at this passage. First of all, there's an awareness that should take place. You should look at things differently. I remember one time when I uh, watched one election. It was all done and it was the uh, inauguration. And as, as the inauguration happened, they interviewed some people. And this one person who was uh, just talking to the camera said, I'm so excited so-and-so got elected president because they're going to pay my water bill. I thought, wow, what a great way to vote, pay my water bill. Now, if that was an option, I'm all for it. I'll send my consumer's bill as well. I've got some car insurance bills I can send over. I've got a list of bills I can send over. But that's not spiritual discernment, is it now? There's a spiritual discernment that should happen. There's an awareness, but also there's an alarm. Look at verse 14, alarm that should happen. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest. Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. He says, listen, wake up. Christ will give you this light. It is time to wake up. It's time to get your head out of the sand. Listen, we cannot sit idly by. Please, please do not say, well, you know what? I'm just not going to vote. All right? On a side note, please, no, absolutely go vote. Go vote. 
I read uh, recently a statistic that if all Christians voted, we would control 90% of all elections. Now that boggles my mind. I, I, I think that can't be, but I, you know, uh, that's what they say. G go out there and vote. I would believe, I have to believe that if everyone for First Baptist voted, we would influence this county. We'd influence this city for sure. And these townships for Jesus Christ. No, no, no. Get your head out of the sand. There is an alarm. N awake thou that sleepest. No one that I know who is saved and loves God and is right with God likes an alarm clock. So if you like one, you're obviously either not saved or not right with God. You know, most of us do not enjoy that alarm blasting us back to reality in the mornings. Right? We, we, don't, we, don't, look for, uh, we don't look with excitement. I can't wait because tomorrow morning, my alarm's going off. This will be a great day. My own alarm gets to go off and it's going to jolt me out of a perfectly beautiful sound sleep back to reality. No, most people have a similar reaction to alarm clocks when they, when they buzz. Ugh. Some go a little further, slap. Some knock the phone around the room, boom. Some can sleep right through it. Right here, what Paul is saying in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is, there is a spiritual alarm clock going off that's going, uh, 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 wherever your alarm clock sounds like. It says, wake up. Wake up! It's time to wake up! Get up out of your sleep! Sometimes, sometimes I have to wake up children who like to sleep through alarm clocks. They're not always excited that I'm waking them up. They don't look with me and say, Dad, thank you. Wow, you're the best dad in the world. You woke me up. I was hoping to get up today. No. Get out of bed, Doreen. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not true. No one likes an alarm clock. I don't know about you, but I've had, I've had a, a dead arm on alarm clock day before. You ever have, you ever, I sleep on my arms. You ever have your arm be dead when the alarm clock's going off? You're trying to, trying to turn it off? Boy, terrible feeling. All right, you're trying to get your arm across there. It won't even work, all right? You drag it over. You know, you drag it off. So now the alarm clock's buzzing on the floor. Burn, 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 burn. Terrible feeling. The spiritual alarm clock going off. It says, Awake thou that sleepest. Christians, we put ourselves to sleep in this day and age. We go about our business, live our lives, casually share the gospel, try to have a limited influence around us, and we are in essence asleep. We're in dire straits because there's not an awareness, because we're asleep. It's time to wake up. There's a call to, to action in verse number 15. It's an interesting call to action. I recently went to a meeting uh, of pastors for the political things, and, and people will draw different conclusions about what the best course of action is. All right, and I think we ought to be involved in government. I think uh, there are things we can do. We ought to be well informed. In fact, on the back table, there's some voter registration guides, some other uh, information for you to help, uh, and, voter, and voter guides back there. And so please take full advantage of that. But my main job is not to go to Lansing. My main job is not to go to Washington, D.C. My main job is to further the kingdom of God. That's why verse number 15 says this. See then, that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What does circumspectly look like? Well, it means walk, first of all, diligently. Or walk in this life on purpose. When you vote... When you interact, do it on purpose. <laughs> You're like, yeah, that's right, Pastor. I do do it on purpose. When I post this on Facebook, it's on purpose. When I'm in an argument, it's on purpose. No, 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 no. On purpose for the Lord. Purposefully Christian. Purposefully spiritual. Purposefully wise. Full of wisdom. You know what that means sometimes? That means sometimes you ought to shut your mouth. Let me break it down for you. Just shut up sometimes. All right, you shouldn't say that when you preach. I probably shouldn't, all right? But you'll get that now, all right? So you know what? Someone's spouting off. 
then remember that a soft answer turneth away wrath. The grievous words stir up, stir up anger. Listen, you can have the argument, but you can just walk as a Christian and not. You can just say nothing. You can just not post. You can just say, well, that's interesting. That interesting, that says it all. I didn't say I agree with you, I just said it was interesting. Then what do you think is interesting? <laughs> the fact that you look so intelligent, but you're actually a moron. That's interesting. <laughs> Interesting that how, how you could even do this job and you take any kind of brains, which obviously you have none of. That's interesting. No, that's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Sometimes we need just to be quiet. Walk diligently. Walk on purpose. Purposefully wise. Purposefully spiritual. Purposefully Christ-like. Walk diligently. Walk circumspectly. It means walk diligently. It means walk perfectly. Now, not in the sense that I mean where you'll never take a misstep because we have the flesh inside of us. I mean by perfect is when the Bible often uses the word perfect, it means complete, holy, turn towards something, walk perfectly toward the Lord, His way, His direction, His mind, and then lastly, walk carefully. Walk carefully, not foolishly. The qualifier is in the relation to the light that is in me. Do I know what God's desires are or have I been influenced by culture? Of that same group, the 18 to 24 evangelicals, nearly half of them Right over half believe that the Bible is the word of God. Nearly half favor same-sex marriage. Nearly half. We're in dire straits. That's not a heart that's perfect towards God. Toward God, You don't get that from reading your Bible. You get that from walking according to culture. Not God's word. Do I know what God's desires are? Do I have the heartbeat of God? Do I have the thought of God? Look at verse 8 in closing. I think this is the key that unlocks the passage. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness. And before, you were darkness. You were foolishness. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Christian, you're now a child of God, so act differently. You're a child of God, so speak differently. You're a child of God, so live differently or live life in a light with a light focused life. That means God's word should influence my thoughts, decisions, and speech. We have right now in our country a great divide on equality, racism. We find the answer in God's Word. Lord, we'll get to that next week. We're all created equal. All right? There is, there is no difference in that regard according to God's worth and God's value. You get that not by culture. You get it from reading God's Word. As you go back in history, you see that sometimes churches did not operate that way. All right, I, I, can't, I can't talk about, the, I can't give you reasons why they did that, except they weren't living like the Bible says to. They weren't living like children of light. We ought to live like the Bible says to live. Live with a light-focused light. Allow the light of the gospel to influence your thoughts, your decisions, and your speech. There could be one thing for Christians, I would encourage you to temper your speech with the light of the gospel. You can attract people with the beauty of the gospel. You can repel them with the hurtful and hateful speech. Now that doesn't mean you're soft on sin. The Bible's hard on sin. One time someone said that it's hard for them to listen to, to sin. Well, that's what the Bible talks about. <laughs> I mean, almost from cover to cover. 
But the Bible doesn't stop there. The Bible tells us how to deal with sin. Allow the light of the gospel to influence your thoughts. Allow the light of the gospel to permeate your decisions. And seek wisdom from God's word on the key decisions. Now next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about a couple of things specifically that God's word talks about for us. But I wanted to lay some of the groundwork as we navigate this time. We need to act and live like a Christian does. With our speech, our decisions. Pull aside some of our random thoughts and the thoughts that have been influenced by culture and say, God, you called me to be a child of the light. You saved me from darkness to light. So shed your light on my life. It makes me view life differently. That's why I mentioned there are some things that just aren't core issues. I'm not saying that I'm against them, all right? But I'm not going to die on a hill for those things. I'm not. I'm thankful for the freedoms that we have in America. I hope we gain more freedoms, not less freedoms. We are very blessed, blessed in this church, blessed with church and all the things. And I'm even blessed to be in Michigan. The same as they well, bless God, I'd rather go move to a different state. Well, go ahead, but there are other states that have it far worse than we do. Far worse in regards to church. All right, we, we, have, we have been blessed here with this. And I hope for more freedoms, not less freedoms. I tell you what, that's not going to change who I am before Jesus Christ. All right, we're still having church. We're still worshiping God. As we navigate this time, we need to navigate it with a light-focused life. I had a Christian recently tell me that the reason they're voting for somebody is because, strangely, just because of personality. And I said, well, how do you get away from abortion? Well, that doesn't matter. Does it matter? Does it matter? I didn't know we got to pick and choose in God's kingdom. If we do, I've got a wonderful list. I'll pick and choose some things. But we don't have that luxury. Listen, I hope that as we navigate this in the next week as well, that we approach it from the light of God's Word. As a true light bringer, light giver, as a true author of wisdom, He gets to tell us how to live. And I may not always like it. In fact, there are some days my flesh doesn't like it at all. It's still true. Lord, help us as we follow you, Lord, that we would live as children of light. Lord, may our speech be tempered by the light from God's word. Lord, may our spirit be controlled by the light from your gospel and your spirit. Lord, may we not neglect the light that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that if we need to, we'd wake up. Lord, we're not here just for our own agenda. We're here to please you. Lord, I pray that we would navigate this time with your agenda.